Hello and welcome to 2024 San Francisco 49ers team preview. Yes, sadly, fourth and one stop away from winning the Super Bowl, but new year, new 49ers squad. Brock Purdy, Christian McCaffrey, Debo Samuel, Brandon Nyrick, George Kittle. Tons of fantasy relevant players to talk about. All that and much more here in the next 30 minutes. Strap in. We're talking all things 49ers. I'm your host, Ian Hardis. Welcome to the Fantasy Life Show. And joining me, as always, is Fantasy Life Director of Analytics, all-around baller, Dwayne The Rock McFarlane. And Dwayne, the numbers say Brock Purdy is an incredible quarterback. The film, honestly, I think does to a pretty good extent as well. The man is not Jimmy G. I don't know what people that say that are watching. What are your thoughts on Brock Purdy, though, as an elite fantasy quarterback? Well, I mean, I think he's shown that he can do it over the last two years, 0.62 and 0.59 fantasy points per drop back. So that's elite for a pocket passer. Um, you know, typically to get up towards that 0 0.6, 0 0.65, you've got to also be a really good rushing quarterback. So look, I, I get where people are coming from with all the weapons and the people that he's got around him. That obviously is helping Brock Purdy a lot. But from a fantasy perspective, do we really care like how good Brock Purdy is if we stuck him, you know, on the Patriots? You know, would he just look uh, more like what we saw, you know, the last few seasons from Mac Jones? Maybe. But that is the situation. We've got Debo Samuel. We've got Brandon Ayuk just blowing up man coverage. you got George Kittle just beating whoever you put on him. And then you've got the best receiving back in the league in CMC also as just a mismatch weapon out of the backfield. And the thing you got to give Purdy credit for, Ian, is like he is the perfect point guard. Like he just knows how to deal. I mean, great. You don't want to call him Michael Jordan. Well, just call him John Stockton. That's another really good player. Mac Jones slander aside, we have seen the 49ers go fifth, ninth, second, fourth, and first in supporting cash rating. Since Purdy took over in week 13 of 2022, we are looking at the number one offense in EPA per play, yards per play, and touchdown drive rate. So really just comes down to is the volume going to be there in fantasy land? Attempted Dwayne more than 35 passes in just one of his 16 regular season starts last year. So when we do look at the ADP side of things, I mean, there's Burrow and Stroud, who are the more expensive pocket passers. And and then on the other side of things, there's the Jared Goff, Matthew Stafford, Aaron Rodgers tier, where you could argue maybe Purdy's a bit overpriced. Where do you fall when he is generally going around that QB1 borderline? I think that's where he should go. Uh, and, and, and I think, you know, when you look at an offense like the 49ers with how efficient they've been, you don't really have to worry about the volume. You know, I think that that can actually be... Um, you know, one of the traps we can fall into. There are a lot of quarterbacks that throw a lot of times that don't score a lot of fantasy points. The bigger thing is having all these weapons around Purdy. So I don't think the efficiency is going to be a challenge. I mean, even when we go back and look at Jimmy G and some of the other guys, like when you put them in the Shanahan scheme and you put all the weapons around them, like they're typically going to play better than where they would in other spots. So I'm not too worried about the volume with Purdy. Would I like it if he threw it like an extra five times per game? Yeah, because I think, you know, they could also just keep on, you know, scoring more fantasy points that way, but they don't have to. That's just the reality of the situation. They also have a really good defense, but I do think he's that borderline tight end one. Once you get to that Jordan Love, uh, you could honestly argue like Dak Prescott, even potentially Joe Burrow. Um, Joe Burrow, we have the weapons surrounding him and a little more pass friendly offense. So I do lean to Burrow over Purdy, but I feel like he is if, if you can't get your hands on a guy like Burrow or Prescott, I feel like Brock Purdy's a really good consolation prize. And would it surprise me if he outscores those two guys? No, it wouldn't. Personally, I've been going out of my way to target guys like Kyler, Anthony Richardson, when we're just doing one draft, trying to, you know, beat the homeboys from back in the day and stuff. But yeah, as Dwayne said, really, really good consolation prize. Let's talk about those pass game weapons because if we're worried about the volume for Purdy, accordingly, we are as well for these wide receivers and tight ends. So plenty of brand now trade speculation throughout the offseason. But as we record this here on July 16th, sure, it seems like he's once again going to be wearing red and gold this season. So after what I achieved last year, I mean, my goodness, most most yards per target in a single season since the metric began being tracked back in 1992 and joins Tyreek, Cooper Cup, Julio Jones, and Nico Collins as the only wide receivers to average over three yards per route run in a single season over the last 10 years. That said, Dwayne, just 101 targets ranked 37th in the NFL. I mean, your fancy life projections only have them for 110. Pales in comparison to guys like Drake London, Chris Olave, Marvin Harrison, who are all 130 plus. So is Ayuk, obviously, we all agree he's an amazing wide receiver, but is he good enough to make up for having a less than amazing target share? Yeah, I think he's slightly overpriced just because of the situation right now. Honestly, I would rather have Debo Samuel. 
uh, because Debo gets the automatic targets that uh, go underneath the coverage. He's always gotten those. So really, you're depending on the defense to give you those man coverage looks for IU to really go off. Now, last year, he was great at that, but he's also probably due for some touchdown regression. I mean, the guy is an amazing player. I think, again, like you said, we're not we're going to I'm not debating that. I think he's probably a top four or five wide receiver in the league. Just asking him to go out there and beat who's across from him, get open, which is the main job of a wide receiver, and then you know do great things once you get the foot once you get the football. Ayuk can do all of those things, but it's going to require an injury to a teammate to truly unlock everything for him to hit his upside where he's going right now in drafts. I'm slightly lower than ADP right now over on Underdog Ian. He goes as the twelfth wide receiver off the board um, over on ESPN and some of these other formats, it's still around that same spot that he's going. You're just getting him a little bit later because receivers don't go as early on ESPN and places like that. But I've got him ranked right now as my 14th wide receiver. So just a couple of spots behind, I do think it's going to be a little bit difficult for him to, to pay this off without an injury to a teammate. It is really interesting. Like if you look at last year, uh, targets behind the line of scrimmage, Debo Samuel, 25%, Brandon Ayuk, 0%. Targets of 20 plus yards down the field, Brandon Ayuk, 21%, Debo Samuel, 9%. So, like, they both have their role in this offense. But the thing that tips me more to Debo is, A, he goes cheaper, and in he also gets the rushing attempts. So once you stack on the rushing attempts and then the easy targets he gets from the scheme stuff, I feel like people are probably getting a little bit ahead of themselves. Look, I like them both. Like, I like them both, but I think both of them, there's going to be some difficulty paying off without one of the others getting hurt, which we never want to see. Ayuk actually wide receiver 18 in ESPN ADP right now. So if you do want some exposure and shares to him, that is the site to go ahead and get it. In regards to Debo Samuel, coming off a season in which he finished as the wide receiver 13 in PPR points per game. But, you know, I've equated him almost like the Nick Chubb of running backs over the years because he needs to be one of the most efficient players in the league to get by with his less than stellar just kind of overall workload. Expected PPR points, shout out PFF for the data. Wide receiver 14 in 2021, a wide receiver 21 in 2022 and wide receiver 33 last year so to Dwayne's point really do unlock the ceiling when one of these guys misses time I remember that early season Giants game last year where I believe Ayuk was sidelined and you just saw the night and day difference with Debo actually getting the run you know some big boy wide receiver routes down the field so I know 49ers fans love to just look at the last game and say oh you know Debo can't beat man coverage what good is he yeah guys you know he's the best yak wide receiver in recent memory and certainly in the freaking modern last 10 years so so absolute dog and yeah dealing with uh, one of the better one two punches at wide receiver here's to hope and maybe just maybe some of these offseason murmurs about Kyle Shanahan really opening up the pass game come to fruition of course the third banana is you know also a fellow complete dog George Kittle tight end one I know a lot of people have been loving the you know Netflix receiver series that is showing again just how freaking dominant my man's is but again Dwayne not to you know beat a dead horse here but targets are a problem just 94 86 and 90 over the last three years he will be 32 in october and again if you just look at the fantasy points per game ppr he has gone down in every single season since 2018 culminating with a freaking you know what would that be a seven year low 12.7 last season so we know he still has the spike weeks but man are you really confident about paying up for a guy that had 11 games with five or fewer targets last season yeah i don't worry about it too much and i mean the the challenge with Kittle is different than Ayuk and Debo. The wide receivers that are going in the same range as them, I think clearly you can make a case over them. With Kittle, it's you've got Dalton Kincaid and then you've got Kyle Pitts. So the question is, do we think Dalton Kincaid or Kyle Pitts, do they take a step forward and actually, you know, become even better players in potentially better situations, right? Where it's not as crowded. But I will say with Kittle, we know what we have. And even though that's 14.3, 13.5, and 12.7 fantasy points per game over the last three years, well, two out of three seasons, that's over 13 and a half, which is the which is a tight end three number over the last three seasons. So essentially, he's posted top three numbers in two out of the last three seasons. He hasn't shown any signs of declining. One of the things you want to look for in tight ends is their decline against man coverage, their decline, uh, whether that's on target share or whether that's on their air yards. And Kittle just destroyed last year. I mean, the dude had 25% of the team's air yards against man coverage. That's his best mark in his career. So when he's healthy, I think he's still top two, top three tight end in the game. The, the challenge is, you know, how crowded it is. So you're either betting on one of the other younger guys to take a step forward and become as good as George Kittle in an offense with more room, or you're just like, you know, 
I know George Kittle's in a crowded offense, but I know he's an absolute beast. And 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 there is a there is a scenario, Ian, where we're just hoping Kyle Pitts or Dalton Kincaid can be 13.5 fantasy points per game, right? They're nowhere close to that yet. Like both of those guys would have to take a 30% leap in their production to get there. So I think that's one of the most interesting spots in the draft uh, when you're deciding between, you know, two different kind of archetypes, if you will. Like if you look at the complete picture for those players, which one are you going to lean to? So I, I've been taking all of them, but I, I got to say, I have no problem taking George Kittle in round six I, I or, or round five, just depending on where I'm drafting from. Like I, I, I love it. Typically, it's around six, right? When you're taking him, and I've taken plenty of Kittle. Kincaid and Pitts are cheaper than Kittle on ESPN and Yahoo. Pitts goes almost a full round behind him. So I do think, again, some of that concern is being baked into the ADP. It's just like, man, projections, 82 targets. That's behind guys like David Njoku and Dallas Goddard. Need 32-year-old George Kittle to not lose a step because if he does, all of a sudden, going to be looking a bit more like potentially guys like Pat Frymer, Dalton Schultz, in the box score than we would prefer because, sadly, in the year 2024, you cannot score fantasy points without getting the football. Got to hate that. Of course, we do have the number one star in all of fantasy football residing in this offense, Christian McCaffrey. Dwayne, in what fantasy world slash format should we not be drafting Christian McCaffrey with the first overall pick? Uh, full PPR, three wide receivers. I'm taking C.D. Lamb over him. Uh, any two wide receiver formats, uh, I'm, I'm taking Christian McCaffrey first. Unless, unless you know, you've got double flex, then you might talk me into still trying to race for wide receivers. Uh, but for the most part, you're taking CMC. I will say it won't surprise me if Bijan or Brees Hall knock him off, and they're both younger. Um, so the biggest concern with Christian McCaffrey is you're getting some mileage on the tires, um, getting a little bit older. And again, it is a crowded offense. But as long as CMC is healthy, I think it's really hard to project anyone else outscoring him in fantasy football. 49ers RBs, a.k.a. McCaffrey, played 80% of the offensive snaps in 53% of their games last year. Only the Buccaneers and Giants were also over 50%. So true workhorse role for, you know, just the uh, all-time leader in fantasy points per game, regardless of position. So got to love that. But, yeah, man, the one argument, I guess, would be would just be how much better McCaffrey was relative to any other running back. And, yeah, maybe Bijan, maybe Brees could catch up. But, you know, I do wonder if we can just have a similar, you know, oh, Pitts and Kincaid could catch up to – you know Kittle argument as well but last year anyway difference in total PPR points between the number one and number two fantasy scorers quarterback was 13.4 total points wide receiver was 12.5 tight end was six running back 122.6 so CMC truly in a land of his own I do get the argument for CD to Dwayne's point in again three wide receiver full PPR formats but as Dwayne said we are taking CMC 101 pretty much everywhere else but guess what guys we got plenty of tools to help you decide just that draft champion mock draft simulator all sorts of really cool stuff and you can learn all about that and much more here's a message from the one the only Matthew Berry we'll be back right after this quick word on Fancy Life Plus you know, when I started Fantasy Life, I had one mission in mind, really just one. Fantasy football and sports betting for all. And what started out as just a newsletter has now grown into a full-fledged media company. And here I am to tell you we're ready to evolve yet again. I'm introducing Fantasy Life Plus. It's a premium product built upon a suite of fantasy and sports betting tools to take your game to the next level. I, I know, I hear you really, Barry, a premium product. Okay, I understand, but get this. Our mission has not changed, right? Our newsletter will forever remain free. All of our expert analysis, free. And we will still provide sets of fantasy football rankings for free. Everything you need to be a great fantasy football manager, you will still be able to do for free at fantasylife.com. But hey, if you really want to level up, then Fantasy Life Plus is for you. Fantasy Life Plus will introduce new tools like our draft champion, customizable rankings, site-wide league sync integration, player prop models, game models, DFS pick'em builders, and so, so, so much more. Seriously, just check it out. Go to fantasylife.com to learn more. And as always, may your trades never be vetoed, may your flex plays always work out, and may your Monday Night Miracles always come through. 
Thank you, Matthew and Dwayne. Back to the 49ers. We really are seeing the same kind of group coaching here. It's Kyle Shanahan once again. He's been in charge since 2017. But in that span, just in terms of raw pass play rate, the 49ers have only ranked 30th. I mean, the third most run-heavy team in all of professional football during that time. So, honestly, just looking at the offense, my only concern would be that this offensive line, like, thank God for Trent Williams, because otherwise it is a pretty mediocre group. PFF's 21st ranked offensive line they do return four or five starters they added third round Kansas offensive lineman Dominic Pooney and did sign a couple tackles in free agency but any thoughts that hey Purdy really going into his second full year in the system you could you know obviously took over a bit over the halfway point back in 2022 but with Purdy ascending and putting up the numbers like could we see something a bit closer to maybe the 2016 Falcons in terms of leaning into the passing game more yeah, I mean, it's possible. I mean, it's possible. And and like the offensive line, I will say like with Kyle Shanahan and with this this sort of scheme, they do a lot of things, honestly, to offset not having a ton of elite offensive linemen. Um, just all, all of the the play action stuff, the boots, the motion, and, and you just always have to respect the run game so much. It's, just, it's, it's hard to get yourself into a situation where you can just tee off on Purdy and on the passing game because you've got to truly respect, respect every square inch, every gap, every, every potential thing that could be coming at you from this offense. And I think that helps offset the fact that they don't have a ton of elite offensive linemen. So when I look at this scheme, though, Ian, like, just talked about it, you know, with the play action passing, talked about it, you know, with with the motion stuff. Um, the thing that really helps Ayuk and Debo and Kittle is they don't run a ton of three wide receiver sets. And well, Kittle is as good as any, you know, third wide receiver in the league. Right. So, I mean, I think that is something that does actually help still consolidate things just enough for us. I mean, they're obviously all them plus CMC. They're all just going to get their own. But the big thing really is, you know, what you get with the play action passing, passing and what you get with the motion. So last over the last two years, 49ers ranked second in motion at the snap for their wide receivers. So Debo and, and Kittle, too, that's for the tight ends as well. Those guys are all getting, you know, just a little bit of an extra advantage like they even need it anyway. But you love to see it when you have a coordinator like Kyle Shanahan that is willing to do those to do those sort of things. Unlike some guys that we see like Zach Taylor uh, in Cincinnati, even though he's got a really loaded group as well, he doesn't do those sort of things. So major hat tip to Kyle Shanahan, constantly doing things to get his guys in the most advantageous situations. And that helps us in fantasy land. Obviously, a ton of really great play callers out there. Sean McVay, Ben Johnson's of the world. But for my money's worth, the Kyle Shanahan, Mike McDaniel partnership, and now obviously leading their respective different teams, really are in a class of their own. And I mean, you see it with the motion that Dwayne mentioned, the play action over the years, and honestly, man, just even some of the more creative nuances. I mean, I remember when Lamar threw that long touchdown against the Dolphins and everyone lost their damn minds over him dropping back lefty before switching back to righty. I was watching Brock Purdy every single like drop back he had earlier this week and he was pulling that stuff off during the first month of the season but when Brock Purdy does it the national media tends to not freak out to quite the same extent so great stuff going on in San Fran and accordingly they have an 11 and a half win total this year just plus 105 on the over and join I will happily be eating up that value give me the over for arguably the most complete team in football I mean again as I said at the start of the show fourth and one stop away from being your rating Super Bowl champion so defense has been top 10 scoring in three of the last four seasons and they continue to not get complacent in the offseason. Adam Malik Collins and Leonard Floyd to an already loaded defensive line and then used two of their top four picks on probably their biggest weakness, which was their secondary. So last five seasons, they've won 13, 6, 10, 13, and most recently 12 games. Yeah, give me the over, and I think they do deserve to be minus 200 favorites to win the NFC West. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned it. 13 and 12 wins in the last two seasons. So it is it's still it's a high number because it requires health you know if anything if something happens to Brock Purdy this number's probably gone so that that's the biggest risk with with betting it assuming everyone you called him Mac yeah. Jones man I don't know yeah I mean maybe maybe I think that's a stretch though like to just assume it like Mac Jones we don't know is he Jimmy G or is he Brock Purdy like he might be a lot more Jimmy G so you know I just I think back to Jimmy G and the wincing and how uh defensive players you know would make fun of him because when they were about to to sack him you know they felt like they heard a little groan or a you know a whimper I just think back to that Mac Jones picker picture when he had the high ankle sprain you know they're trying to get him off the field down into the locker room and he's just like in all this he's in complete agony um you know I don't I don't I'm not calling out Mac Jones's toughness or maybe I just did but I shouldn't <laughs> have because he's probably far more tough than me Ian um you know 
I do think if Brock Purdy goes down, like there's there's major risk to this. It's just so high, man. It's a high number. I mean, you can say about any offense every, in the league, probably. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, eleven and a half wins, like that's really high. Uh, I mean, obviously, you got what? Who else is there this year? The Chiefs, the Chiefs and the Ravens, I think, are the other two teams projected that high. So anytime you're that high, I typically just take the take the under. But I'm going to go with you on this one, hard. It's I'll take the over. My guy, and guess what? You guys can also go with Dwayne and I on. Taking some action over to DraftKings Sportsbook, one of our partners over here at Fancy Life. Right now, all new customers who bet just five dollars will get one hundred fifty dollars in bonus bets instantly. All you gotta do is download the DraftKings app now and sign up using our promo code Fantasy Life. That's right, new customers who can bet just five dollars on anything and receive one hundred fifty dollars in bonus bets instantly. And if sports betting is not yet available in your state, don't worry. DraftKings is the one-stop shop for all things daily fantasy. We can join in on all the fun and have the shot to win cash prizes. Download DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Again, new customers use our promo code fantasy life and bet just five dollars on any wager and get 150 dollars back in bonus bets the crown is yours obviously with such a great offense we don't have too many question marks but there is one going on at the wide receiver three spot now one of the lesser important i guess wide receiver three spots in the nfl because of the 49ers insistence on keeping all world fullback kyle juice check so involved this led them run the third fewest plays with at least three wide receivers on the field over the past two seasons that said we do have first round pick ricky Pearsall joining you know a guy who is unironically looking like the super bowl mvp front runner after 45 minutes of action jawan jennings in the offense so yes parasol savvy route runner we can talk about his ability to beat man coverage but just in terms of jennings still being there Dwayne, i don't see an easy path for parasol to get on the field i see a guy who's probably going to make the most out of a 50 percent route rate something along there and just in terms of projecting this offense i don't know how we can be having him higher than probably fifth on brock purdy's pecking order so yeah if if I hear Debo get traded, that's a completely new uh, element and everything, but it doesn't look like that's going to be the case. And accordingly, you know, I'm shocked when I see people selecting Parasol over someone like Xavier League at, at the same portion of the draft. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, I think it's going to be really tough. I don't think he's immediately going to get all the slot reps. I do think Jawan Jennings, who they brought back, will get some of those, who's also a really good blocker in the run game. That's still TBD on Parasol. So, I, look, I, I think he's fine in Dynasty. I, I think he's fine, you know, if you're playing in a super deep league, but in a lot of home leagues, like I'm not drafting Ricky Parasol. Like I, I'm I'm just not doing it. I think really the 49ers are looking ahead, you know, with this pick. Honestly, like looking at the rookie supermodel, I think you can argue really he shouldn't have been a first round pick, but it was at the very end of the first round. And that's typically that's almost more like a second round pick anyway. He was an older prospect, didn't really ever break out in a big way in college, was good, but I mean he was never great. So I do have concerns about his overall profile as well, but I think the 49ers were looking ahead just knowing, can we continue to keep Debo Samuel and Brandon Ayuk together, knowing that they're about to have to extend, you know, or have to give Ayuk a new contract. So I feel like they're going to see how that all plays out this year. And there's a chance that Ricky Parasol is a name that we're much more excited about next season. But I think a, an injury has to break his way. And even then, Ian, you're counting on him 100% beating out Juwan Jennings to take over you know, whoever's role is left behind. But I think like Ayuk would be the main guy that Parasol would be trying to replace because I see him as being the guy you already mentioned his crafty route running. Like he's the guy you're probably looking to, to beat man coverage. He's not going to be the guy you're trying to scheme up to do the Debo stuff with. Again, two year, $15.4 million contract extension for Jawan Jennings this past offseason. Joined Puka Nakua as PFF's only two wide receivers with a run blocking grade north of 80. So, yeah, not saying Parasol won't be a great NFL you know, player down the line, but in 2024 specifically, just don't see him having enough volume. Another guy that won't have enough volume, Dwayne, without an injury is RB2 Elijah Mitchell. And yes, I do mean the RB2. I know we've got, you know, Isaac Orendo joining, you know, the just. What's the right word? The hilarious kind of number of day two, day three running backs that Kyle Shanahan and John Lynch have drafted. And then potentially we'll see what happens with Isaac, but never really used Tyrion Davis price. You know, we had freaking, was it Joe Williams back in the day they were pounding the table for, for a lot of, uh, you know, guys that again, got some draft capital that never actually did anything. Trey Sermon, probably the poster child for that. Cause again, continues to be Elijah Mitchell from the athletics, David Lombardi. Elijah Mitchell is clear. Number two, all around back. He is health, a training camp 
yields a productive RB logjam. It's fair to point out the 49ers have previously traded running backs like Breida and Jeff Wilson Jr. when they've had an excess of depth. And even last November, man, because I remember when Jordan Mason was averaging 5.2 yards per carry, Mitchell was more at 3.7, and a reporter asked him about that. Shanahan responded, we look at more than stats. Mitchell's our number two back. He's done some pretty good things here, and JP's our three. He's been our two at times, but it's how most cases are in the NFL. And Dwayne, I mean, again, even if you don't want to listen to these coaches and the you know, beat reporters, you can look at what happened last year in the second half of week 17 and into week 18 when CMC suffered the calf injury and see that Mitchell on 32 of the backfield's 41 total touches, ripped off PPR, RB19, and RB14 finishes in those two games. So, no, I think we've seen over the years that he's not going to get this CMC pass catching role that really would elevate him to RB1 heights. But if anything, man, we have roughly 16 regular season games worth of evidence that Mitchell can and will be an upside RB2. Any chance CMC is on the sideline, and that's a pretty damn good value for a guy regularly going well outside the top 50 running backs, usually even the top 60 in fantasy land. Yeah, and Elijah Mitchell is that archetype, like the Shanahan tree, like they like to have one of those on their roster, right? A true slasher with just that burning speed. Doesn't always work out. <clears throat> Tatum Bell, rest in peace from back <laughs> in the day. That one didn't work out. But uh, he, he's the guy that can hit the home runs, and we know that. Now, I think, you know, the wild card factor is they did draft Garendo. So I think it's something we've evidently, we've, we've obviously got to pay attention to this through training camp, which those are starting to get kicked off now. So we'll start getting more information. But yes, right now, I would assume that Elijah Mitchell is the running back too, unless we hear otherwise based on what's happening in, uh, in the camp battle situation. Have my handcuff running back tiers article go up on fantasylife.com, which you can check out for free this past Monday. And yeah, Mitchell did land in my tier three, one injury away from being a solid fantasy RB2. A lot of guys in that tier, like Austin Eckler, Jerome Ford, Ty Chandler, Rico Dowdle, again, going well ahead of Mitchell in more fantasy drafts than not. So for my money's worth, Mitchell and Clyde Edwards Hilaire really standing out as, again, some of those awesome, almost literal last round picks who can, again, be one injury away from likely being on the cover of most waiver wire articles around the industry takes us to the final part of our team preview podcast we were going to compare the 49ers to a movie character and i'm still kind of leaning i guess on the 2023 team but for me man i'm going to go with any of the non-best picture award-winning films from 1995 i I think the 49ers if they play the chiefs 10 times i really still think they were probably the more complete team and they went about six of them so guess what the chiefs won the one that matters who the hell cares what i think about that but man forrest gump won the best picture in 1995 great movie i'm not here to shit on Forrest Gump just like the Chiefs are a great team but let's face it Shawshank Redemption and Pulp Fiction those are objectively better overall movies and that's just a fact at least you know in my incredibly novice sense of film making and everything like that so we'll see what happens this year Shandy and company have been getting so close to Super Bowl glory certainly think they have again the complete overall roster to hopefully finally get it done in 2024 what say you Mr. McFarlane I'm gonna go with Brock Purdy as Batman Um, you know, all the nice things we said about him, we still don't know. Like, is he actually a really, is he a superhero himself or does he, does he just have the most money that buys all the best weapons, the best vehicles, the best gadgets. He's got a cool grappling hook. You know, he's got a tool belt with all these, he's got the greatest tool belt, you know, on the planet. It's got Debo Samuel in it on one side. It's got Brandon Ayuk on the other. Then you got George Kittle, you got CMC. So I will go with Batman. And at the end of the day, guess what? It doesn't really matter, like we said before, for us in fantasy land because he puts up tons of numbers. He knows how to use all of those weapons and all those gadgets, which is more than we can say for a lot of other quarterbacks. So don't take this as knocking Brock Purdy, but I would have to go with Batman. Not sure he has actual real superhero powers, but really good at using all the tools that he has. Would be a lot cooler if style points did matter in fantasy. Point per hurdle, actually, you know, maybe not get the same amount of points for a 40-yard bomb as a pop pass that goes 40 yards. A man can dream after all. But that's going to wrap up this edition of the Fantasy Life Show. I want to appreciate you guys tuning in. You guys already know where you can find the rest of this goodness. That's FantasyLife.com. And we would appreciate it if you want to go ahead and sign up for Fantasy Life Plus, just trying to make you all some money. So for Dwayne, for producer Matt, I'm Ian. Thanks again for tuning in to Fantasy Life Show. And until next time, take care, everybody.